I do. Yes, there is a higher power. There is something that brought us here. No, not for me. Not for me. No. Yeah, uh, there have been times at church where, you know, something has just moved me and I get goosebumps, like you just mentioned. And I feel like it's not a coincidence. Like, something just, it's in your soul. It's like bigger than just your anatomy. It's like in your soul and you can feel it. You can feel like your gut or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. it, you know, comes out in this goosebumps and sometimes you get teary eyed. Mm -hmm. That comes just from inside you or from somewhere greater? Somewhere greater. We're all here of something greater. And spirit, as I said, which translate in, translates into many religions, you know, Holy Spirit, all of that. We are all one. If the Holy Spirit exists, what's his job? What's the Spirit's job? Good question. Huh, to let folks, you know, us here on earth know that uh, there is a heaven. You know, I'm not the most spiritual, religious guy, uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure if I can answer that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say just give you a slap on the side of the head and say, that way, not that way. <laughs> I try and make my own path and really follow what my gut is saying, what my heart is saying. And um, there's, there's a lot of things that are pushing us away from trusting ourselves and what we're actually feeling, so. I try and live by that every day. It's uh, difficult to fathom, I think, for people of other religious persuasions as well. Yeah. They have some trouble with it, I know. Uh, yeah. Last week we had Dr. Tim Brown here. Uh, he was my professor of preaching. I hope you enjoyed hearing him teach. I'm sorry he used the word imprecatory psalm without warning us. Anybody else remember that? We said, do you know what an imprecatory psalm is? I want you to know that when he said that, I was like, please, God, don't ask me right now because I couldn't remember either. And I was in seminary for nine years. It's a three-year program. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> people are like, it's such a success. I'm like, really? Is it? All right. But... um. I love Dr. Brown. I love his teaching. I love his love for the Word of God. And, um, and I'm excited today to talk about the Advocate. When we talk about the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, it is an uncomfortable topic for us frozen, chosen, reformed people. And I am not being mean when I say that, but I will tell you this. I was raised in an environment where I would say I'm a recovering Pentecostal. Um, I was raised in a Pentecostal church. And um, some things went on there that I didn't, I, I'll be honest, I look back with and theologically don't agree with, but there are things about the Holy Spirit that are completely missed in our Reformed tradition because we have it all right up here. We are theologically sound people. We know what we believe. We have the five solas of the Reformation. We, we know what's going on up here, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings life to the knowledge. Talks about the wind of God, Right? The ruach is the Hebrew word. The spirit, the pneuma, that's the Greek word. The spiritual experience. And we think, what does the spirit do? Well, God took from the dust and formed Adam. And then what did God do? He took and blew into the nostrils of humanity. The ruach, the spirit of God, filled Adam. The wind of God. It blows where it may. It fills whatever is open and vacant for it. And we recognizing, we recognize today that the ruach, the, the, the wind of God, the spirit of God is what animates our everyday ordinary life. It brings to life a, a two-dimensional picture and gives it depth and perspective. And today we're going to talk about the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the one who is sent by the Father. And in John chapter 15, Jesus refers to it again and again, 14. 15, 16, as the advocate. There's this other word called paraclete. I love that word because it's just awesome to say, the paraclete, right? If you remember the paraclete, it's this. The paraclete is the spirit of Christ. The spirit of God, but it's the spirit of Christ. The one that reveals and helps us understand who Jesus is. So today we're going to turn our hearts towards the one who does the work that none of us can do. He takes all that we know and puts it where it matters most. He animates us into a life for Christ. He connects our head knowledge to our heart and soul and gives it feeling and gives it life and gives it some kind of punch and energy. Today we talk about the Spirit of God. And I'm going to invite you to do some things that are wildly different than we typically do in the Reformed tradition. 
Let's read this scripture from John chapter 14, 25 to 27. Jesus says, all this I have spoken while I'm still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. I always find it interesting whenever there's a spiritual experience, an angel or the spirit of God moving, what does it say? Read the story of Jesus walking on the water. They were afraid, right? Read the story of Mary when, when Gabriel came, they're afraid. And Jesus says, peace I, live with, I leave with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus is making a concrete promise. He goes on in John chapter 16 to make some more promises and some more clarity around who this Holy Spirit is. Jesus says, rather, you, the disciples, are filled with grief because I have said these things. He was telling them that he had to go away that he had to go back to the Father, and they were sad because they loved having Jesus with them, and he was their identity. And he says, but truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, if I don't go away, the advocate, the Spirit of God will not come to you. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? It is good that I'm not here so that you can experience the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the world He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. He speaks of the devil. The devil stands under the condemnation of God because of the work of Christ. Jesus goes on, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will know and make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said this, that is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So it's kind of this opaque, hard to grab, but really good thing, right? It's a really good thing. Jesus is saying it's actually to your benefit that I'm not still here because if I was still here, you still wouldn't get it. You wouldn't be animated into Christian life. You would do exactly as I do, trying to imitate me, but Jesus knows that the only way to truly imitate him is to own the message inside. To own the message inside. So this is, this is kind of Jesus' promises. Now I want to do a little bit of what Dr. Brown did last week. I want to take and see how Jesus made this real. How did it actually work? Acts chapter 1, we find Jesus, after he was resurrected, he's moving around and he's, he's encountering people and then he's ascended. And then Acts chapter 2 happens, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And at the giving of the Holy Spirit, what we find is there's people gathered together for this, this pilgrim feast that happens every year in the Hebrew tradition called Shavuot. It's the Festival of Weeks. Now, we're not going to talk too much about that, but Shavuot was going on. It's a big pilgrim feast in the Hebrew calendar, and everybody's there for it. The disciples and all who believed in Jesus were also in a room, and they were gathered, and they were waiting, as Jesus said, for him to send the counselor, the advocate, the Spirit of God. And suddenly, the sound like a violent wind came rushing into the room. Tongues of fire descended and landed on the heads of people, and they began to speak in over a dozen different languages, and giving witness to the glory and the promise of who Jesus Christ was. And people from all nations, Cretans, Arabs, all over the the Mediterranean said, how are they speaking in our languages? Are these not just Galilean and fishermen? At one point, someone says, I think they're drunk. It's at that point in Acts chapter 2 where Peter stands up with the other 11 disciples. And he says, 
Israel and all who are in Jerusalem, listen to me. I will explain to you right now what's going on. I will explain to you what's going on with all these people. For these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Give them a break. No, no. Let me explain that that something different is going on. And I think it's important to understand that Jesus is, or Peter is about to reveal what Jesus had promised. A spirit of truth is about to come flooding into their life. And when we see the spirit of truth arrive, it does a few things. And we'll talk about them after we go through this scripture. So Peter stands up and he says to you, let me tell you what's going on. These aren't drunk as you suppose. Actually, what's going on is these people, these people speaking in tongues, And doing these different things, this is exactly what the prophet Joel said. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters, and they will prophesy. Your young men will see, will have dreams. Your old men will have visions. I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, and they will prophesy. I will give signs in the heavens above, and I will give signs on the earth below. Blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will turn dark. The moon will turn to blood on the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. But all who call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Fellow Israelites, you need to listen to this. This Jesus Christ was accredited to you, validated to you by miraculous signs and wonders that God did through him while he was with you as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's plan and God's foreknowledge that you in turn handed him over with the help of wicked men to death by nailing him to a cross. But God has raised this Jesus from the dead and God has freed him from the agony of death and it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. Just as David said about him, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord because he was ever before me, and he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and I rejoice with my mouth because my body will rest in hope. You have not abandoned me to the realm of the dead, but you have called me into life, and you have not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, and I am filled, I'm absolutely filled with joy in your presence. I think that's an important thing we often miss. David, Jesus' 27 times over great-grandfather, said he was filled with joy, which is kind of a prophetic tone of what happens with the Holy Spirit. Fellow Israelites, Peter goes on to say, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the David who wrote the psalm I just quoted died and his tomb is right over there and we can see it to this very day, but he was a prophet and he knew that God had sworn to him on an oath that he would always have his heir on his throne. So David prophesied about the resurrection of the Messiah when he said that you will not abandon him to the realm of the dead or let his Holy One see decay. God has raised this Jesus Christ and we are all witnesses to it. He is exalted to the right hand of God and he has received from God the promised Holy Spirit which has been poured out and you now see around you taking place. For David did not ascend to heaven, he died. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Therefore, friends, be assured, all of you, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, to the glory of God the Father. At this, the people listening to Peter were cut to the heart. Have you ever had that? 
Have you ever had something literally cut you in half and you're like, oh, if I could only undo. When you learn what you've done to hurt somebody or when you've been you know, caught doing something wrong and you're cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart and they cried out to Peter in the middle of the temple, what do we do? What do we do with a message like this? How do we live with this? Because now we know it here, but what do we do? And Peter said, do two things, sing, like these two single things in tandem, repent. And repentance is not saying, I was wrong and I feel bad here. That's not repentance. Repentance is saying, I know I've sinned and I will do it no more. And I will turn from it and I will walk the other way. That is repentance. Repent and be baptized. There's an interesting reality that takes place because 3,000 people repented that day. Can you imagine being like, whoa, well, I have to lead them in some way. Can you imagine what Peter thought? Like, we need some sort of administrative assistance. Like, he had to feel lost. 3,000 people said, okay, we'll be baptized and we repent. And he had to be like, oh, shoot. Oh, what do we do with this? Well, God had already pre-planned everything. There's this thing called the mikvah, which is the Jewish place where they go and they wash before they go into the temple. And there were hundreds of basins down right below the temple steps before you come up the temple mount. Where do you think you take 3,000 people to be baptized? They went down to the mikvah, and they would have been baptized, and they would have repented. And Peter says, when you are baptized, you repent and you're baptized, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the church took off like a wildfire in Southern California in August. Nothing could contain it. Why? Because the Spirit of God had been turned loose on people who knew something of God but now feel and experience something of God in their deep inner being and their life must give witness. We recognize that the Spirit of truth, if Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the Spirit of God will illuminate the truth and it does something and the first thing we know is the Spirit of truth came to teach It came to teach the people of God. Look at Peter. Peter was a fisherman, probably a young, mid-teenager when Jesus first met him. He was a fisherman, ordinary. Just, he would mend nets, he would catch fish, he would sell them to the guy, and that dude would take it to the market. What did he do the next day? Mend nets, catch fish, sell them to the guy to go to the market. And the next day, And then he just lived a very monotonous, ordinary life. And Peter stood up on the Temple Mount in the middle of a pilgrim feast in Jerusalem and laced them with the word of God. Why? Because the Spirit had come to teach them something. And one of the truths is everyday ordinary lives display the gospel beautifully when we're open to the move of the Spirit. Your everyday ordinary life can be something that teaches the world who Jesus Christ is. If you would have the courage to do what Peter did and stand up, raise your voice, address your audience and tell them who he is and what he's come to do. Peter was fearless in this. When the spirit moved on him, the man who betrayed and hid from Jesus three individual times the night he was betrayed, Peter did that. Do you know Jesus? No, I don't. Aren't you that Galilean? No, I'm not. Hey, aren't you the one who was with Jesus? I don't know the man. Leave me alone. Those are Peter's words just a few chapters earlier. And now he's on the Temple Mount just slaying it with a sermon. He's teaching them not by his own power, but by the Spirit of God. If you feel ill-equipped to do the work of God in your generation, praise God for that. You could actually be one of the greatest tools in God's hands. It's the people who feel equipped and religiously secure that run people who need Jesus away because you look just so good. I'm tired of people looking good. I want everyday ordinary people like me and like you to go out and share the gospel, not by our knowledge, but by the one who animated us by his spirit and brought life to our bones. The second thing is, is he came to remind. The spirit of truth came to remind. The world that Peter was preaching to had to deal with the fact that almost half of Peter's sermon on Pentecost Sunday was from the Old Testament, quoted out of Joel and the Psalms. Peter did not make this up on the fly. He quoted Joel and the Psalms throughout his whole sermon. Why? 
Why did Peter's sermon have the Old Testament? It was to remind the people listening that this is not something God just decided to do and flip a switch. This was always God's plan. God is not doing this kind of willy-nilly. God is actually reminding them that this has always been his plan, that Jesus Christ would come, that he would suffer, that he would die, and he would be raised again. And by believing in him, repentance and baptism, we could become sons and daughters of God. He reminded them to trust in what God had done in Christ long before Christ was ever born into this world. God had been at work. So he says, let me remind you, He reminds them over and over again. Finally, or thirdly, the the Spirit of God comes to glorify Jesus. And we recognize this. It happens in this text, and we can see it really come alive in this line. Jesus Christ, when when Peter stands up, he says, Therefore, all of you Israelites, all of you who are listening, let it be known, and you can rest assured that Jesus Christ that God has made this Jesus Christ whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. The word Lord would be the name that they used for God in the Old Testament, Yahweh. He would have said, this man is part of the Trinity. He is the Son of God, co-equal to the Father of God, and he has sent the Spirit of God to do a transforming work. And, he, and the Spirit of God comes and glorifies Jesus. Now think with me. If you could spend, and we've done this as a family on road trips at dinner times, if you could spend an evening with 10 people, who would you choose? And I'm sitting there, I'm like, a Winston Churchill. I would love to have dinner with Winston Churchill. You'd have to catch him early because I think he got pretty drunk at most meals. But, um, so you catch him early in the meal and you hide the scotch. But I'd love to sit with Winston Churchill. I would love to sit with Peter and Paul. I think I'd be scared to invite Jesus because it would just be overwhelming. But I always come, I'm like, oh, I'd really like to have dinner with Jesus. And the disciples did for three years. They ate with him. They walked with him. They slept next to him. John reclined next to him. And 50 days after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected, the disciples were still sitting in a room not really knowing what to do with Jesus whom they had been with all the time. They'd been with Jesus, but they didn't know how to really give witness to him until the Spirit comes and uses their life to glorify Jesus. The Spirit's work always puts Jesus front and center of all that is, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come, the Lord Jesus Christ at the bright center, and the Spirit of God glorifies Jesus Christ in his work. We know that for sure. The fourth thing is he turns our grief to joy. And this is a unique thing to me because Jesus says just a few chapters earlier in John when they're around the Passover table, he says, look, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be lame. It's going to be hard. But take heart. I've overcome the world. He turns our grief to joy. The Holy Spirit turns our grief to joy. And the best example of this is what the people replied when Peter got done with his sermon and they were cut to the heart. They were grieved. They were ashamed. They were embarrassed. They came for the wrong reason and now they knew what they had been missing and they were grieved and they said, what can we do? Have you ever gotten to that point in your life where you're like, what can we do? How do we do this, God? How do we face what's before us? And Peter calls us to something that we in the American church and the Western church have failed miserably at and can do so no longer. He called them to repent. If you're tired of the grief that holds you, the only way, and usually, and when I speak of grief, I'm not talking about the loss of a loved one or something. I'm talking about the grief that comes when we recognize we have grieved the Holy Spirit, we are separate from God. The only way to reunite And our grief to be turned to joy is to recognize that we first must repent. And there are issues and things in our lives that we think are just okay, and God says, no, they're not. His word is very clear on who we are called to be. And there are behaviors and patterns of sinful living in our life that must be repented of long before we can ever experience the joy 
of new life in Christ. Because I guarantee you, those same people who screamed out to Peter, what do we do? Left the temple in a happy place, a joyful place, wanting to connect with the body of Christ. They were thrilled with what they had learned and experienced because they repented and they were brought in baptism into the covenant family of God. And this baptism in this covenant was not just for them. It was for them. It was for their children and all who believed in Jesus Christ. What we recognize is that we must become people who profess our faith, not just by banging our gums together, but by living for Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Meaning, if you go and do a bunch of profane and unholy things, do you think the Spirit can abide in a place with such darkness? I do not. People say, why does the American church seem spiritless? Because we've grieved the Holy Spirit with our crazy materialism. How much is enough, Mr. Rockefeller? Just $1 more was his answer. And it would be the same answer for you and I. How much is enough? It's never enough. It's never enough. We are crazy idolatrous about what we own. We are idolatrous about what we eat. We are idolatrous about so many things that if I sat and like laid them out, we would be like Peter said, cut to the heart. Because we don't recognize in our own life how deeply we've grieved the Holy Spirit. It is time for the church to repent and follow Christ in his mission, not ours. We are finding where God's at work and it starts with repentance and then we will join him in it. So, How can we recognize that the Holy Spirit is here? How do we recognize that the Holy Spirit is here? What what is the evidence in our life? What is the evidence in our life that the Holy Spirit has filled us? How do we know the work of the Holy Spirit? And what is the evidence of it? It's a frightening silence inside of us, isn't it? When we don't know what the work of the Holy Spirit is. We don't know what the evidence is because it's been so long since the Spirit of God from Acts 2 has invaded the church of 2017. So, let's look back. Let's apply it in these three ways. The first thing we recognize of how we recognize or see the Holy Spirit and give evidence is does it glorify Jesus? Does your life glorify Jesus Christ? Does your life clarify who Jesus is to people? Does the way you live clarify to people who Jesus is? You think, why does that matter? Because when Jesus was with the disciples for three years, they still couldn't figure out who he was, but when the Spirit of God came, they knew. And it was unmistakingly clear of who Jesus was. And Peter got up and delivered a sermon that would make anybody like me or any pastor after just kind of shrink into the shadow and go, that was really good, man. I wish you wouldn't be in our profession. Because he slayed it. Why? Because the Spirit clarified who Jesus was. This Jesus whom you crucified, and I'm not speaking of the Israelites anymore. I'm speaking to you and I. This Jesus whom we've crucified, God has made him both Lord and Messiah. And your life should be giving clarity to who he is. It should convict of sin. It is a glorification of Jesus Christ when a Christian or a person who didn't know they were living in sin before falls heartbroken over the fact that there's sin in their life and realizes that they have been unfaithful to God either either knowingly or unknowingly. They just recognize they've been unfaithful. When the Spirit of God convicts us of sin, it glorifies Jesus because when the, when the Holy Spirit begins to transform the life of really messed up people, the world takes notice. The world takes notice and recognizes something's going on. Our transformation from our dead self to our alive self in Christ glorifies Christ. Look again at Peter, the one who denied him three times to the one who proclaimed him faithfully. The difference was one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit. The other had his own ideas in mind. Second thing is, the Holy Spirit, how do we know his work? How do we um, see the evidence? The second thing would be this, that the Holy Spirit does not ever contradict 
Jesus' words. The Spirit of God will never tell you to do something that Jesus Christ did not, that Jesus Christ said do not do. If someone's like, you know, the Lord told me to just run off with this, this woman and, and leave my wife and kids because I love her. No, no, that's garbage. You can, you can actually wrap that up in a diaper and burn it. <laughs> that's a lie from the pit of hell. See, we spiritualize things that are not spiritual. We spiritualize things that are just blindly bloodlust within us. The Spirit of God never contradicts what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when someone says to me, "Mm, Jesus is one of the ways to heaven, part of me in my soul shudders and shakes. Not because I think they're bad people, but I want to be like, Oh my gosh, how can I be standing here as a spirit-filled Christian trying to to ask you questions about God and you think that it's okay to think Jesus is just one way to salvation? Jesus said, I am the way. So we can't be people who think it's okay to get to God. I mean, if Buddha's your thing, get your thing. You know, no, that is not it. Jesus and his words are never contradicted by the work of the Spirit. Never contradicted. The third thing. Well, here's one way that blows my mind. So can you jump back real quick? Sorry. Um, this happened when we were planning this series out. Um, Erica and I were talking. We really, we wanted to use all of John, the gospel of John. And, um, and she was kind of, she shared her idea and her idea was better than mine. But, um, but we were talking about it and we were working through it. And she said, I, oh, I just, I'm not supposed to use John 11. I was like, but that's Lazarus. It's my favorite. I, I like Lazarus come forth and all that good stuff. And why? Oh, fine. And then we planned the series out. We didn't use Lazarus, John 11, and I was kind of sad. And, um, and we had talked about it a number of times. It just didn't fit. It was, oh. And so I had, Tim Brown is um, kind of like, not, he, he's a lot smarter than I'll ever be, but he's like me in that he doesn't return emails, phone calls, and face-to-face messages sometimes. And um, he's just, he's kind of that way. And um, so I drove to the seminary to find him, couldn't find him there. Um, I finally called him one day, and I, I texted him. Turns out I texted his wife Nancy's phone. <laughs> That's how you get his attention. And um, so Nancy's like, you call this man back, you know, and oh, my gosh. So he, he texts me back. He's like, I'm sorry I made a mistake. I'm like, no, it's cool. It's literally my DNA. Um, so you're good with it. And he said, you know, we started talking about the sermon series. I didn't even tell him what we were doing. And I said, you know, we're, this week is about the word of God. And I, I want you to do your thing with the word of God. I want you to just share scripture with them. Show them how it lives inside of you. Show them that reading the word and studying the word, it helps it live inside of you. You know, it just, could you just put on the scriptures and wear it like a robe for the morning? And he said, yeah, can I do John 11? And I was like, Sure. I wanted to, but you can't because God planned it. Like, I get all, like, tender and emotional to it because I didn't understand why a beautiful resurrection story would be missing. And I think God was like, could you stop being like that? I've got it. He didn't contradict his own words. He didn't cut something out. He actually made Lazarus far more alive last week in that story than I ever could have. I love the fact that the Spirit of God doesn't contradict the Son of God. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is glorified and made evident in our lives because the Spirit of God never contradicts him, ever. The third and final thing is this, that we recognize that the Spirit of God displays or grows in us a certain grouping of... Ways of being, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. I have pushed on this a number of times. It wasn't intentional, but it keeps coming back up. If those are lacking in your life, Jesus Christ is lacking in your life. If those are lacking in your life, the Spirit of God is lacking in your life. One of the most brutal honest and harsh indictments I have ever received was from a friend and a mentor who said to me, I see none of the fruits of the Spirit in your life and ministry. It was like being punched in the chest by an elephant foot. Just whop. And I was like, oh. And I just sat back. He left my office and I just sat there. I don't know how long, but I remember eventually saying, how can that be? 
I thought I had served you. I thought I loved you. And the reason I was grief-stricken and cut to the heart is because it was true. And it was at that point that I fell on my face before God and said, return your spirit to me. I confessed my sin. I repented. And I'll be honest, I have seen those things in different measure return to my life. It is not easy, but the life of a believer is one that gives witness to Christ, not by your good behavior, but by your spirit-filled obedience. Pray with me. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of your spirit, work in us in such a way that the glory of Jesus Christ would be the evidence of our life in you. That Jesus Christ would be glorified. That his word would be held up as true. That our lives would never contradict that which you said, Lord Jesus Christ. God, thank you that Jesus knew that it would be good for us to experience his departure from this earth so that we could be a spirit-filled people. May it be true of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's two things you can do at this point. I don't know about you, but um, when, I, when I wrote this and was working on this, I sent an email, or I wrote an email, I haven't sent it yet, to the gentleman who came to my office and reminded me that the life of a Christian was to bear fruits of God's kingdom, not mine. Because I appreciate it, even though it hurt. I hope this hurts. I hope that you are sitting out there thinking, I may not go back to that church if they are going to call me to give witness to Christ in the way I live. Then make that choice. Or repent and let us be a place where the fire of God burns out our windows and doors. And people come here not for the worship, not for the preaching, but they come here because they know this is where transformation starts. That the Spirit filled the people of this church. And people came to know God, not just here, but in the way he engages our living every day. So today I invite you to gather with any who are in your circle. And to be honest today, about what you need to repent of. If it's a family, gather at your table. Dads, learn to say I'm sorry and repent. Moms, learn to say I'm sorry and repent. Kids, follow the example of your parents because this is not just for them. It is for them and their children and for all the world around us. We must be people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I invite you, if you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can come up and I can pray for you Or you can go in the quietness of your own life and invite him who changes everything to breathe the breath of life into you and animate this carcass to living life of Jesus Christ. Go and be the church, gathered and now sent, filled with the Spirit, equipped to do all that you are called to do in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.